This is the Kern Antelope Valley Historical Society meeting at the Wanda Kirk Library. And we're looking at Cleo Goss's paintings that are up on the wall. And some of these supposedly have hidden pictures in them. And there's a whole wall here that are on display until March 26th in the Wanda Kirk Library. And get herself over here. So I was giving her about five minutes and she did it. She's here. Um, thank you all. It's wonderful to see this crowd. Of course, I know what the attraction is. <laughs> um, I have a couple of announcements, and there's a tiny bit of business that we have to conduct before we let Dan have the floor. Um, as we have been talking, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Current Antelope Historical Society. Um, and it's going to be a big display of about Roseman and things in the area. It's going to be on May the 9th, which is our regular meeting night. It will be here in the library. And the library is going to be open all day so people can come and see what we have. Fran, do you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah, we have many exhibits that are going to be here. Um, we're going to have an art exhibit on that wall. The feline compound is going to be here. The sky park is going to be here. Uh, there's going to be um, Little Springs display from the old stagecoach area and a, and a few others. So, plan to have quite a few things going on here. And we are going to have Willow Springs Raceway. There'll be a race car out from the parking lot, as well as a Model T Ford and our wind up thing. And a couple other, another older um, truck. So, you thought that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I was talking about, there, right? <laughs> so, we have quite a bit of effort being put into the, by the community to help us celebrate our 60th. And you'll get to see the original um, 60 members or so of the that started out the current animal history. Sorry, it'll be on display also. A list, so, uh -huh. yeah, so. a list, right. Anyway, um, also, and Fran, don't go like that. Oh. Fran's involved in this too. The Historical Society is continuing to work with the Roseman Community Services District on trying to get some kind of an arrangement so that we can use the building on Diamond Street that belongs to RCSD for um, housing our artifacts and our other materials that we have as part of the Historical Society. Um, and Fran, has, Fran and Terry Lansidle are actually chairman of the committee who are dealing with RCSD on that. So Fran? And we actually negotiated with them on Monday. They are checking with council right now to see how they can lease us, uh, lease us that property. So um, it's still in the works, but we're hopeful that we will soon have a Roseman Museum. So they're in favor of it, and so are we. Big project. Lots of things have to happen, and we're going to have to rely on some grants if we are able to swing it. But anyway, the other little bit of business Per our bylaws, we are to finalize the slate of officers for next year at this meeting. We don't vote at this meeting, but we finalize the slate, which will then be voted on at the April meeting. Our committee um, has come up with some names. Um, the nomination committee, um, I'm on as president, Dolores Julian as vice president, Janet Winters as secretary, the treasurer position is open, and then we had Siobhan Sladek, um, Fran Thompson, and Terry Lansidle as members at large. Now, I need to open 
nominations to you all. I need to get them from the floor. Um, are there any nomination, additional nominations for president? Are there any additional nominations for vice president? Any additional nominations for secretary? The treasurer has no name from the nominating committee. So is there a nomination for treasurer? Janet? I'll nominate Terry Lance, I don't. Okay, I don't believe I need a second on a nomination, do I, Matt? No. I didn't think so, okay. He's my parliamentarian. <laughs> um, the members at large were Shabani <coughs> Sladek, Fran Thompson and Terry, but now Terry has been nominated for treasurer. So I now need to open the floor to a nomination for a member at large. Anybody? Help? <laughs> we need somebody. Um, I recommend Joe Pauling. Okay. Joe Pauling. Yeah, he, I think he's been asked. He isn't here tonight, but okay. So, Fran, I believe he indicated that he would. Okay, so we have now displayed of officers, and I will read them again, and I will need a motion then to, <coughs> to present this as our slate of officers. Myself as president, Dolores as vice president, um, Janet as um, secretary, Terry as treasurer, and the three members at large would be Siobhan, Fran, and Joe Pauley. I move. Move, move to close the nominations. You make a motion. Okay. Who was that? John Joyce. Oh, okay. Is there a second? Second. That's right. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you all for <coughs> dealing with this little bit of business. Now I'm going to turn it over to why you all here, <laughs> Siobhan, our uh, program chairman. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, we've been uh, delving into Roseman family history this year, and I'd really like to thank Fran. She's the one that recommended that we pick individual families and, and encourage them to do their history. And of course, nobody signed up to do it <laughs> and my granddaughter tonight as we were getting into the car and she knows ann and i are friends and she says did you ask miss ann before you signed her up <laughs> 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 so even my granddaughter was not wholly convinced that she volunteered <laughs> as you are uh looking at family history Town history, um, Ruben, where are you? I just saw you. Um, Bob Key Ford, uh, local history and stuff like that. I cannot encourage you enough to come up with a reference list of where you have gathered this information. And in Anne's story, they had gotten some things from the Ellis Island records. Th this is important not only for the moment, but it's important for in the future because people will update those records and now you can go back and you can say, oh, okay, here's what it said for Ellis Island in 1955. But now all these records have been updated. There's more information. Um, they've been digitized, not just um, microfished. The scanning's better. Um, you know, you, so if you have an original source to go back to, that's helpful. Also, I would encourage you to look for family history in strange places. I don't know how many of you have followed the Roseman Painted Rocks in town. It is like the world's goofiest thing you ever saw in your whole entire life. Um, these kids and adults are painting rocks and they're leaving place, leaving them places and they hide them in another place and, and they have them on Facebook and they leave these hints. Well, son of a gun, there was a little painted rock that was put in front of this gate and, uh, and somebody had asked about the gate. And Carrie Williford said, as a matter of fact, I 
took a picture of the gate. And so this is Carrie Williford's picture of that gate, Justin. And it said, family. We could not choose our parents. We were born to them, raised, trained, and nurtured by them. We could not choose our height, our looks, the texture of our hair and skin. We could not choose the dominant genes and cells inherited from generations of family that lived before us. We could choose the one we married. We were in love, hugs and kisses and holding hands, to be near, to hold, to be close enough to share, to absorb, to absorb the love we had for each other. We could not choose our children, boy, girl, tall, short, dark hair, light hair, blue eyes or brown, a math genius, writer, teacher, farmer, a go-getter, a drifter, a realist, or a dreamer. We could not choose the one our children married, where they would live, how they would live, when they would have children, or the number of children, our grandchildren. We could not choose the physical part of our family. We could not choose the behavioral part of our family. We could not choose the inherited part of our family. We can choose to love our family because of or in spite of actions or behavior. Do not confuse love with approval. We can choose to love. Without love, we have an empty, lonely, unhappy life. And that was written in 1987 by Mike's cousin, Joan Dangle. Dangle. And so I perused to Anne's book and I found that and I thought that was a marvelous way to start tonight. And so without further ado, Anne Yost. <laughs> Whoops, just a, just a half a second. Go ahead, we have old lady's eyes taken care of. Is that okay? Perfect, that's good. I, um, I have to say that um, what an honor I am to, I have to be here. I was reminded by a dear um, old friend and, and workmate that uh, I used to read to children all the time. I shouldn't be nervous at all. Here I am now reading to older people. <laughs> um, so to begin, a lot of you would wonder um, how, what my connection is to the family. It, it's him. <laughs> so some would ask how I am a Yoast. Here's a quick entry um, to the story. In nine, late 1960, my family lived across the field in Lands of Promise. And in 1972, early 1973, it became apparent that my family was a little bit of a mess. And there came the Yoasts. And they fostered three of us. Why would a couple who had already raised one son and already in the military and another son in his senior year and a daughter 14 take on three fosters? Because that's who they were. Amazing. My brothers moved back with my mom in 1974, but I remained. For a while, I was the only child left at home. And I must say, I loved being the only one. And they always loved me and reminding me that I was there. So to begin, how do you tell the story of people who have become bigger than life in the memories of your heart? <clears throat> well, you could begin like the greatest giver of stories did. In the beginning, that's fine. In the beginning, there was Friedrich and Alice, and Friedrich begot William, and William begot Verna, and Verna begot Michael, and that would be boring to all of you. <laughs> So let me begin with the opening of the gate. Frederick, Frederick, they called him Fred, um, Schroeder came from Germany and entered New York Harbor Port of Entry on October 21st, 1882 on board the SS Willard. 
He petitioned to become a naturalized citizen and went through all of the paperwork required to become American. Um, his father and mother and some of his siblings remained in Germany. Frederick was 15 years old when he came, settling in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He met Alice Swearingen, an immigrant from the Netherlands. Alice and her family came to the United States in 1880. Fred and Alice met, married, and remained in Grand Rapids all of their lives. Fred was a machinist for the railroad, and Alice was a dressmaker. Alice and Fred had eight children. Their fourth child, a son named William, is where we connect to Rosemond to be on the gate of 2929 Desert Street. Bill, as he was called, joined the Army Air Corps and was stationed at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. In the spring of 1927, Bill was accepted in, as a warrant officer in training at Logan Field, just outside Denver. Bill, who was a wonderful musician, added a little extra money to his meager military pay by playing the saxophone at a local nightclub after duty hours. The following story was told to me by Verna G. Schrader during our Sunday night visits. I loved sitting by her as she would share amazing stories of her life. I called it Sundays with Grandma. So Verna Guernsey, Grandma, was the daughter of a doctor and his wife. The family lived in Colorado Springs most of her childhood. And after she graduated high school, she moved to Denver to attend cosmetology courses. Grandma was happily married to a local podiatrist back in Colorado Springs. Did I forget something? Engaged. engaged. Sorry, she was engaged. Oh. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> He's heard the, oh my goodness, I didn't know this a million times. Um, so she was engaged to a... Um, a podiatrist back in Colorado Springs, and one evening she agreed to go listen to a small band appearing at a local nightclub one of her girl, with one of her girlfriends. That particular night, not only was Bill playing the sax, but he was also the band leader. She noticed that he was staring at her, and she really didn't think much of it because she was happily engaged. Mm -hmm. The next night, after returning home from school, Bill was waiting for her on her porch her girlfriend had given him her address. After weeks of surprise visits, Bill tells her he's a military man. She had no idea. And that, she, and that he was supposed to return to, um, to San Antonio in two weeks. So they were married quickly. After, right after that, she breaks off her engagement to the podiatrist. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. Bill was a quiet guy. He loved music and he loved grandma. Grandma did not like military life. She'd been born a daughter of a country doctor and his wife, and while they were not rich, they lived a comfortable life in Colorado Springs. She was close to her siblings and now could only communicate by letter or telegram. San Antonio seemed a half a world away to Grandma, and the stuffy rules of military was not for her. A year later, Mom was born. To keep everyone confused, both Grandma and Mom were named Verna Violet. So to try to keep you clear, I'll call Grandma Grandma, and Verna is Mom. Verna was born in 1929. Two more little girls followed in like stair steps, Alice in 1931 and Billy in 1932. Grandma was always the queen bee, and she'd boast that her children might be military children, but they would be the best dressed children on base. She would say as long as she had her sewing machine and a little garden, she could be happy anywhere. Grandma was a firm believer in disciplined children. She, shot, she thought that they should be made to be, behave as soon as they exited the womb. And yet being with her was a place a child could feel most safe and wonderful. She loved to dress herself and her family well. 
hats, heels, gloves were all part of going out. I remember like yesterday, she invited me to go to town to Lancaster with her and, and there she was, her usual dressed beautifully self in a white pan suit. Her head was covered with a large white straw hat and she had those big sunglasses like a movie star. I came bouncing out in a pair of jeans and a tank top. She sat down, placed her purse neatly in her lap, and with a perched lip of disappointment, she said, it's okay, I can wait while you change. <laughs> As military life would have it, Bill was stationed at other bases during his 27 years of military <clears throat> service. Bill made it a habit of writing nearly every day, and Grandma kept most of those letters. <clears throat> After her death, we found a large box of letters, always ending in, love you oodles and oodles of noodles, or catch a later doll, or his favorite, forever your sweetheart. Uh-oh, sorry, Ann, I screwed up here. <laughs> oodles and noodles, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Of 1939, Bill was assigned to Hamilton Field. Grandma and the girls traveled from Sam, Fort Sam Houston to Los Angeles and from Los Angeles to San Jose by train. These are those very tickets. And if you notice, they are um, no transportation to be <laughs> returned. They moved with just what they could carry and the belongings were sent um, forward by the military. Grandma and the girls remained at Hamilton Field, but Bill did not. He was soon sent to Rice Field, just outside of San Bernardino. Rice Field no longer exists as an air base, <coughs> as a military base. While going through boxes of letters and pictures, I was reminded of how in those days most communications were done by letters or telegram. Bill sent telegrams often. I guess they were early text messages to say. <laughs> My favorite was one um, sent to Grandma when he received leave, and you can see it says bring six cigarettes. I don't know, it must have been wartime or hard to get them, but that was important to him. In 1942, Bill received his last military duty assignment. It would be to Muroc Airfield. Grandma went to visit him and check out the living conditions, and this was her reaction to Muroc. As expressed to Mom, telegram to Mom, Dearest Verna, I've been to visit Father in Hell. I'll be home soon, love Mother. <laughs> she doesn't look very happy there. <laughs> The family moved to a small town of Roseman, traveling by car. They rented a house on Park Place, east of 20th Street, built by the Coleman family. I don't know if, if you remember, some of you that were here years ago, in that little group of houses that was behind 20th Street. Now there's a housing track, but there was several little houses over there, and that was their first home. Vernon began high school at Avey High because Roseman only had Roseman Unified, which is now the old section of Roseman Elementary. Sixteen original classrooms housed K through eighth grade. Here is the eighth grade graduation program of Alice. You can note inside of it um, names like Roy Loomis. Oops, right here, and right here is Roy Loomis. Thomas Roy. Thomas Roy. Mm -hmm. um, and Peggy Ann Davis, lots of old names. Um, I was impressed with how military influence in the school was even back back then, and um, and with all the controversy over military ROTC in our schools now, I can see that because we were so close to a military, it really was. Um, significant even back then. Um, the girls were in active in school activities. Verna wrote articles for Avi High School newspaper and they were in Wayside Chapel Choir. 
the old Wayside Chapel when it was on Diamond Street. It's now a Catholic church. For a while it was an Episcopal church and then the Masonic Lodge, now a church again. Um, the girls were in Girl Scouts and Rainbow Girls and Grandma was involved in whatever they were doing. In 1946, Bill and Grandma bought a lot on Desert Street from Mr. and Mrs. Hummel for $450. I'm going to stop right here, and uh, if you see right there's the $450, and right here is George Hummel's signature. It was actually three lots. Um, Dolores helped me see that t tonight on the, um, on the land agreement. It was for three lots that... The lots are really deep over in there, so they run, run kind of kind of different. Um, so they bought the land. Um, where am I at? Okay. Um, for four hundred and fifty dollars, um, Bill, who had um, connections on base, was able to um, acquire two dismantled Quonset huts from the Manzanar concentration camp. For the cost of transportation, they would be his. We went there um, to walk around, several of us, um, this last week, and we noted that the floor, um, it wasn't a cement slab underneath the, the quonsets. They were dirt underneath, and they were kind of set up on, on brick foundations on the, on the outer edges. And then if you see right between, they had built a, an entryway and then um, a little scary room, my kids called it, and then the den, which had a fireplace. And the fireplace, it still remains, and the patio. Halloween, that used to be the really scary house to go visit. <laughs> Um, okay. The family reconstructed the buildings on Desert Street lot. They gathered rocks from the nearby desert and built the fireplace and enclosed patio using rocks and concrete as both decoration and function. A gate was added, trees were planted, family memories were created beyond the gates. Bill retired from Edwards and opened a small TV repair business in the house. When Wayside Chapel moved to its new location on Glendower, Holy Cross Episcopal Church occupied the building under the sponsorship of St. Paul's Episcopal in Lancaster. Bill was named head lay reader, and his commitment to the little congregation of Holy Cross was recognized by a telegram from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles Bill died of a massive heart attack in 1961 at 59 years of age. Before, Bill before Bill's death, all three of his daughters graduated from A.B. High School, married, and made their own little homes close to the little house on Desert Street. Memories were made and grandchildren played and stories still continued and still continue beyond those gates. After Verna graduated, she was offered a summer job at Edwards Air Force Base. In June of 1947, a young airman deputized and awarded badge number 777. In 1981, Flavian was honored with a community service award for 30 years of service to the community of Roseman. Another grandson, R. Michael, also followed in his grandfather's steps of service and is a deputy with Los Angeles County. And he this is his son, Jordan, who's now much bigger. And, <laughs> and the helmet that he's laying in was Dad's. Um, let's see, where was that? Um, Flav was the kind of guy who built handicap ramps for neighbors, ramps for neighbors, chaperones senior trips, and picked up not-so-sick grandkids so that they could stop at Foster's, because a malted always made them feel better. <laughs> Verna involved herself in PTA, Women's Club, Rainbow Girls, and was the glue that held our family together. 
She worked and retired from Southern Kern Unified School District. She was part of Dr. Shear and Dr. Himes' team in district office. Mm -hmm. She worked with such wonderful ladies as Greta Castle, Penny Lemieux, mm -hmm. and Ruby Lambright. Um, she put her talent, after she retired, she put her talent of sewing to the valuable task of sewing gowns for the Shriners Hospital. She would painstakingly create gowns that would meet the, those little children's disabilities. And Flavian was a 32, second degree mason, and that was a requirement for Shriners. Verna volunteered her work well, volunteered to work with Joe Kingrop for many years in the office of Wayside Chapel. She held together our family with unconditional love and um, dedication. Tom Leftwich was an old family friend and, um, and he sent our family a little bit of, uh, of a letter that just was special to him and I thought it would be fitting and, and Mike's going to read it to you after he drinks. <laughs> First of all, I don't have a mic. Can everybody hear me? Now you do. Oh, oh now, I, now I can talk real, real soft. <laughs> What's a Yoast? Wilbur White introduced me to this guy called Flavian in 1956. I had recently been assigned to the experimental track branch at Edwards, and at that time I was driving a gas hog of a, or of a torpedo model 1947 black Buick with white sidewall spoke rims. Flav suggested that maybe I ought to hang a foxtail on it. <laughs> this was the kind of commentary humor that I was to enjoy from him up until he retired. Flav was a very dedicated civil servant and among other things a very good horseshoe player. He beat me a few times, like every time I played him. <laughs> One of his many talents was playing harmless jokes on fellow workers. Some guy, I don't remember who was, always leaving his half-drank coffee cup on a file cabinet next to Flav's workbench. The guy used too much milk, and it was always sitting there through the afternoon looking nasty. He wasn't in too good a mood at this time because he was allergic to the new Teflon coating they put on all of our hookup wire. He suffered many days doing his job while suffering the effects of this allergy to his hands. Wearing white rubber gloves to ease the pain and reduce the exposure, he answered questions with, I'm studying to be a gynecologist. <laughs> the new epoxy we were using to mount instrumentation to our Sierra Sam dummies was a quick setting glue that would glue to anything. Would I ever blame Flav for gluing that nasty coffee cup to the top of that cabinet? Not me. The only curious thing about all of this was Flav was the only one that used this epoxy. But the cup never showed up again. One reason was they had to chisel what was left of it from the cabinet. One important thing I have to mention at this time Flay was the top instrumentation man at the track branch, so when you read the history of Edwards, and no mention is ever made of guys in trenches, the amazing and wonderful developments always attributed to engineering management were actually developed by guys like Flay. When things went wrong during the test of new instrumentation, he was the man at the workbench telling engineering how it, would, how it could be changed to make it work. Jokes were one of his favorite subjects. Always depend on Flav for a good laugh like this. Okay. The cowboy was always admiring himself in a fancy hand mirror. He hid it from his wife and one day she <coughs> saw him admiring it and smiling big. She was horrified when she picked it up, looked at it, and she busted it over his head saying, so that's the painted old hussy you've been seeing. <laughs> Some things I'm not sure he invented, but this epoxy was responsible for coins glued to the floor in the hall, hallway and on the picnic bench in back of the ops building. I was hoping he would glue one of my horseshoes to the post in the pit. That would be one of the few ringers I made. 
course, of course, you know, he was a volunteer fireman for Roseman, and he was telling me the horror story when the freeway went in. Old Betsy, the pretty red fire truck, couldn't get up the overpass with a load of water. <laughs> he was the one that reminded everyone that we didn't have fire hydrants in Roseman west of the freeway in those days. And yes, you could get over the freeway with an empty truck, which would look good in parades, but wouldn't put out a book of matches. <laughs> I have to admit that he was just as guilty as me when we stole a flight suit of the dummy chimp at the front door of the ops building. It fit me perfect, so I used it for working under one of our 6x6 six six trucks on Saturday. Yeah, I was guilty of the naked chimp, but Flay was guilty of it giving everyone the finger when they came in the door on Monday. <laughs> It didn't exactly make a hit with management. Of course, we were working on a truck and couldn't be expected to know anything about the vandals that assaulted their chimp. <laughs> Flav was a dyed-in-the-wool ham operator. You know one of them. Hey, Bubba, this is Flav. Come on. Fuzz on your tail, good buddy. Tim floor. Yeah, he was the best I ever knew. Many times he built transmission and re receive antennas out of a single piece of coax cable that worked better than what you can buy. He helped me build a rhombic antenna that on some days talked to Hawaii. Naturally, with this degree of expertise, it was only natural that he would get into more trouble. The South Tracks water tower was over 100 feet high. And we configured a long wire antenna from our data receiving station to the water tower. This was not an easy task. And we had to use a steel cable to build the antenna. It worked great as a long wire antenna. But when General Branch decided to buzz us at the station one afternoon, I don't know what he was flying, but he flew under our antenna. Scared the double H out of him. We had to take it down. Then there was that nephew of some high-ranking civil servant, Richard something. He was assigned to the ops section to begin with, and Flav kept him busy looking for stuff, like a package of RF transmission, or a bucket of heavy water from the track water brake system. <laughs> P.S. Make sure you get it from the shallow end. It's much drier there. <laughs> Later, good old Richard was assigned to me and he almost electrocuted himself changing a plug on a 440 line with the other end still plugged in. <laughs> Flay really got him when he tried to climb a telephone. <clears throat> Flay wasn't the best climber either, but when Richard stepped off the roof of our building to the climbing stakes on the pole, he froze in midair and Flay called the fire station to get him down. He was transferred shortly thereafter. <laughs> Were we mean to this guy? No. He had been transferred so many times and promoted to get rid of him. He was making almost twice what we were, politics and action. Another episode Flay was involved in was the X-15 project. He built most of the onboard instrumentation that was used testing seat ejection systems. He was also with the crew that found the lost dorsal fin from its first flight. His record of work at the track branch would probably fill a book in following it Close, it's closing in 63, Flav and I both were grabbed up by manager Ben Bush doing instrumentation packages for all the new fighter aircraft. Once again, the guys in the trenches made most of the recommendations for improvements in design and performance. I was lucky when a job opening came up and I took a 25 cent cut per hour to get the job. Flav was a step ahead of me on the pay scale and he was senior but his cut would have been a half a dollar, more than he could afford with family responsibilities. We didn't get paid much in those days, maybe six or 7,000 for the year. About a year later, he joined my time in section in range management. I had taken the civil service exam and received an, an exceptional rating, lucked out. <laughs> and I pushed management to, to get flayed. We once again were working together for Keith Talbot. Many incidents, all enjoyable, we shared. Carpooling was one of them. Hey, I remember when gas went up to 38 cents a gallon. Everyone, including me, was looking for an economy car. By hook or crook, Flav lined me up with the Nash Metropolitan. 
It was well used and the seats were in a state of destruction. But boy, now I had an econom economy car and it was a dandy. But we were getting a little tired of riding the springs. I found a pair of seats and replaced those in the Metro. Bad move. They sat a little higher, about six inches. And when we, loaded, when we were loading to leave my place on a Monday morning, I was proud of those new seats. But Flav couldn't sit up in them. His head, he had to bend way over. And not liking that, he rolled the window down, stuck his head out the window and said, okay, Lefty, let's go. <laughs> no, I drove my other car and that week modified his seat so he could get all of him in the car, minus the breaking neck. On the job, old buddy Keith Talbo brings a sack of bananas to work one morning saying that he wanted me and Flav to climb our 95-foot tower and install a UHF antenna. As we been, began climbing, we were about 20 feet up when I looked back and Flav is going back down. Hey, what's going on? Flav said, Lefty, you're going to have to do it on your own because if I get up there, there ain't much chance of that. I can't do a damn thing because I won't turn loose to the ladder. <laughs> Flav helped me from the ground and we both enjoyed the bananas. Easter Baby was a jackass that I acquired somewhere. Named him that because he was colored like an Easter egg. Marsha was wanting to learn to ride a horse. I had got old Easter to breed my two white jennies. He was very tame but still a jack. I saddled him up and Marcia climbed aboard. She got out of my yard and down Rye Light a little way. Most folks that ever heard Easter Brain just know that, know that the Santa Fe Flyer must be wrecking in lands of promise. <laughs> oh, Easter began Brain because he was leaving his girlfriends. Flav said he'd swore that Easter was bouncing on the ground with dust coming up all around him. That the sound was deafening. Marsha bailed off and ran. <laughs> Left the old boy standing in the road wondering what happened to his jockey. <laughs> Later I gilded him and the Yost family acquired a stalwart steed that would probably write his own story. I was given a management position in mission control and Flav took over my timing and tactics section. A couple years later, I had to give up because of heart issues, and I was out for two years. It was in the move to the new Mission Control Center that the TACDAX went belly up, and Flav said, give Lefty a call. We worked together solving that problem, a major timing problem that NASA was having with first shuttle landing. A data modem issue for sending data to Cape Canaveral and building a system that he eventually would support all of the shuttle landings. There were a hundred other problems concerning the new timing system that we also resolved. And then he's got a little insert here. This event occurred sometime in the 70s. On a very sad note, we were coming home one afternoon and I was taking Flav to his home. Maybe Vernon needed the car that day. At the crossing of Tropico and Hidden Valley Road, a terrible accident had, accident had occurred and they were looking for a nine-year-old boy ejected from the bed of a pickup truck. <coughs> he had been helping his grandmother to deliver newspapers when they had had a head-on collision. Flav and I found the little guy and he died in our, in our arms. Hmm. The back of his head was crushed where he hit a large rock. I'm sorry that I have to recount that, but it was a tragedy we shared. Yes, Flay was a very special friend. We shared the good and the bad for many years together, and I'm proud to say that he made my career what it was at times, and I have closed since. <coughs> Maybe one of these days he'll say once again, give, give Lefty a call. But let's not be in any hurry with that one, okay? <laughs> Just to finish, Five generations have called Roseman home since 1943, from Bill and Verna to our newest baby, Brooke, 
these town this town has filled our hearts with commitment to with a commitment to serve and even though some have moved to new communities the memories of this little town we all called home cause our hearts to be thankful and our memories to return to grandma and grandpa and the house beyond the gates Joe Pauly, and I, I would encourage you, you know, as you're looking at developing your own family history, it doesn't have to be with the PowerPoint <laughs> slideshow type of thing. Uh, if you need help, I'm available. If you say, um, Mitch Speed, when he spoke, he said, I don't need any slides, and he did not. Um, uh, you know, if you want to bring in painted rocks, and say, here's our family story. Here's what, here's what we've contributed to this town, or just to our own house and our own home. Uh, we would love to have these stories. Fran's goal is to get everybody to compile a written story and for us to publish a written book of Roseman history and stories. So please be thinking about it. And it doesn't just have to be Roseman. I, and it does, yes, East, yeah, uh, so East and Los yeah. uh, County, no. yeah. Right. And um, next month will be Joe Pauly. And goodness only knows what he'll do. <laughs> so I'll let you imagine. <laughs> Fred wants to say one more thing. As you look around, you'll see we have a wonderful art exhibit that was done by Cleo Goss, who was a former Edwards Air Force employee. And Mike, I really like your story because I know Lefty, but I don't remember uh, playing. So, and we worked in the same area, we worked in the range, so that's interesting. Uh, we also have our first donation to our museum, which is in the corner over here. Uh, somebody is donating that to our museum. It's a, a lithograph of the Burton um, camp, gold camp. So, uh, if you guys have a few minutes, please look at the art exhibit and sign our book. This is the first art show we've had here in Roseland at the library, but we're gonna, gonna have more. We're trying to drive a lot of, um, people to the library so maybe we can have more hours. So. And, and just along those line of hours, hours are funded based upon books that are checked out. So if you're already here on a Thursday, that would be a great opportunity to get a library card, grab a book, and return it back, and grab another one next month, and we can kind of boost their books and hours. Then I'd also like to thank a lot of people who brought in stuff for us, for pictures. Um, Dar Darlin Ridley, what's your last name now? Carnes. Carnes brought a whole bunch of black and white pictures of, of previous stuff from Roseman, and somebody gave us a little Bridges uh, um, rodeo, rodeo um, program. Yeah, and yes. Anne, you've given me a couple things back there, so it's really fun looking at these things. So you'll see those, more of these, um, as we progress getting all these things together. We, we, we sure would like to that. collect, so if you have pictures, if you have anything that uh, is of historic value, please at least scan them and get them to us. Also, I'd like, I see so many new faces. We do have membership forms back there now. Our membership year is almost over. It starts again in June, but take a membership form and maybe think about joining. And right now it's half price. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Again, thank you all for coming. Okay, we're here in the uh, we're here in the Wanda Kirk, Wanda, Wanda Kirk Library. We're here in the Wanda Kirk Library with Fran Thompson, who has put up a display on the wall of an artist that she knew 
from Edwards Air Force Base. We used to be co-workers. Her name is Cleo Goss. Uh -huh. She lives in the city of Quartz Hill. Okay. And she was nice enough to do all this because she will be leaving the Antelope Valley probably next year or later this year. Oh. And I certainly wanted to show her prolific art. She uh -huh. has many pieces of art. This is just one part of it. Okay. So, as you can see, she walks around the desert lot. She heard these two quail. Sure. They're in the valley singing. So, if you look at... If you press on this. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> oh. Uh-huh. And so some of these pictures here that she's done are her, for her travels around different places. Absolutely. And there's cards for each of the pictures. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you said be, this is the first. The first one that we know of that we've had here in the library. That okay, our but there's more coming. Yes, there's more coming. Uh, the Roseman High School art class is going to be presenting um, next month, right after we take this down. And then in May, the current Antelope Historical Society is going to be displaying their building history uh, portrayal of buildings, that, what they used to be and what sure. they are today. Sure, sure. Oh, well, that'll be... Fascinating. That'll be on this wall, along uh -huh. with many other exhibits that we're doing uh, that pertain, like the feline compound is going to be here. Good. Um, the Sky Park is going to be here. Good. Um, Willow Springs, that used to be the first stagecoach, so they're going to be here. Then several others are going to come out. Sure, and the raceway so, too, yeah, probably the raceway, should. The raceway, and they're going to actually have a car out here, and then we're going to have a Model T, and mm -hmm. a truck. Yeah. So there's going to be lots of things. We're having the fourth graders come here as a field trip. We've got quite a few surprises for them, little gifts for them when they show oh, up. Oh, nice. So it's going to be a big celebration. Sure. And then we'll have a meeting later in the afternoon, just in the evening, like our 5 o'clock. We'll be celebrating the installation of our new... Um, officers. We'll have cake and punch celebrating our 60th anniversary. Uh -huh. You'll get to see the original list of members uh -huh. along with the, the old uh, museum emblem. So there'll be lots of fun things to see. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh, we'll have to keep